Hello everyone, welcome to Liberable. So, I'm about to go live with Mr. Shaw Nurse. He is a Nisner hill, hill Climb Champion with the Toyota Supra. And we're going to talk all things cars and obviously talk about um, a couple of other small things here and there. So, let me give him a quick call over here. And then we can start talking again. Thank you guys so much for... Um, the support thank you all the partners for supporting me i really appreciate you guys um, uh, signing up to liberable um, and even just to the subscribers all of you thank you so much for the support so let's start this conversation uh, this will be very interesting hello mr nurse how are you thanks on you man lovely 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 good to good to finally chat a bit <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I know we've been chatting on Instagram, but it's yeah. it's kind of better seeing your face and hearing your voice. Than... <laughs> hey, otherwise, how's the lockdown going? What have you been doing to keep busy? Um, obviously, I've still got a publication to run, so we've been doing a lot of stuff for the websites for Auto Dealer and stuff. So, I've been keeping myself busy. So you can see behind me, there's a an unnecessary amount of bicycles. Yes, I've been doing yes. some indoor. <laughs> to keep fit uh flip the old uh, spare bed up here as you can see it in the background just to get space in my spare room so i can have an office slash training mm. cave type of thing mm. um and just trying to keep myself busy with exercise and some work and you know try to stay sane because i don't exactly have a huge house so yeah. i don't want to go mad yeah yeah no i've been skipping or trying to skip and some other things just to keep the blood flowing but um, to be honest with you, it's been challenging, you know, you and I as, um, I think you as a motoring journalist and um, me as a, as an influencer, I don't know how, we, I think we both influence at this point. Um, like, our, creators, I love. yeah, our job is like yeah. driving. Yeah, it, it, we, can't, we can't do anything that really makes content interesting at this stage because we can't actually get into a car, yeah. which is... Which is rough at this point, and I'm getting kind of sick of sitting at home, so I want to get out and drive. Yeah, yeah. Do you think the fleets are going to go back to work um, in two weeks' time? Um, I think we'll see the fleets definitely come back. Um, pro probably in, in two weeks, we'll probably get some correspondence from them. And I would imagine that uh, towards the middle of May or so, we should start getting cars again. And the launch circuit should start up again so that the whole, you know, big machine can can continue yeah. to, you know, feed us with the necessary tools to create content. Yeah, I, I, I actually, um, I was talking to another guy now in the week and we both think that mass gatherings are probably not going to be a thing now till this year is over. Absolutely. I would imagine... Um, my vision for launches going forward, at least for the foreseeable future, maybe till the end of September, October, around there, mm. I would imagine we're going to have a, a sort of Skype interaction like you and I are having now, but with a product manager. So we learn a bit more about the product and then mm. we get sent the vehicle to form our own opinion around so that we sort of minimize social contact and minimize mm. the spread of the virus. I think that for me would make sense. From, I very from much, perspective. I very much agree with you. Um, I think we are living in a, a really tricky time and a time that um, we didn't anticipate 2020 to do this to us, to come in and say, well, fuck all of you, you're not going to work today <laughs> for the rest of the year. And I mean, I mean for, for me, I work for a company, so I, I still get a salary of sorts, but, you know, my heart bleeds for you for you guys that are 100% independent. Yeah. I mean, it's something that I always have dreamt of doing um, is becoming independent, but my heart bleeds for you guys at this time because you guys have no uh, avenue to create content and we know you are able to produce great content, but if you can't go out and drive a car and create content around it, I mean, what are you supposed to do? Exactly. It makes it really tough for you guys. So, you know, from my perspective, the lockdown can't end fast enough. If mm. not just for me personally, you know, for all of my content creating friends who are freelancers mm. and, and have bills to pay. You yeah. Know? I was looking at my YouTube revenue the other day. It's literally halved and halved. Because, can you hear me then? Yeah, because advertisers pulled out, you know. Did I lose you. Oh, can you hear me now? Hello. Yo, can you hear me? 
Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, sorry, I lost you for a second. Then. Okay, cool, 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 cool. I was oh. saying um, YouTube um, advertisers actually pulled out of YouTube, so my ad revenue is halved and halved what it used to be. Yes, man, it's, it's absolutely terrible. Mm. I know, um, obviously, f f from my perspective, w working for a company, I was, like I said, I still get paid, but, mm. you know, things have been drastically affected by, by that. You know, I don't want to go into the details per se, but, you know, it's, and nothing mm. is the same for anybody mm. at this point. You know, the, the future is so uncertain. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm hoping that there will be a, an even bigger appetite for content, the type of stuff that you produce mm. um, after after this lockdown has ended, you know, people are going to want to get out and do cool things with their cars. And, you know, hopefully they can get people like you and me involved yeah. in stuff like that so we can carry on. With I very much agree with you. And and I think at the moment South Africa is quite scared to, to not scared, but they, they like their faith in YouTubers aren't that strong yet. Like I can do a video of a car and be like, okay, cool. So my video sold X amount of cars or this did so much amount of stuff. Like, I don't think that type of information is getting out there enough. And a lot of the people who buy vehicles based on, like, a YouTuber or buys maybe this pair of sunglasses, if I'm advertising it, won't um, won't say, oh, it's because of Liberable or because of Sean Nurse or whatever that I bought this vehicle because they want to look like they made this decision. They're the one who came up with, the, with, with their own decision. Well, that's the thing is, uh, you know, media, obviously the the various manufacturers and, uh, you know, advertising agencies and all that see a value in media still because we give an objective opinion yeah. on something. So yeah. even if they, they can't exactly quantify how many cars were sold as a result of our opinion or how many cars were not sold because mm. we we said that the car was substandard or, yeah. or something like that. They, they still see a value in us because, you know, you're giving an objective opinion or you're creating content like you do with your with the modified or tuned cars. Mm. You're creating content that people want to consume. So there's yeah. still value in that. And, I mean, you know, there's that old saying that any pr any press is good press, yeah. even if it's yeah. bad press. You know what I mean? I, well, I, I, I think – Yeah, yeah, continue. yeah sorry. Continue, 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 continue. continue. So from my perspective, if, you, uh, if you're a content creator or an automotive journalist or whatever you want to label us these days, you know, we've got, all got different names. It depends on how you work within the industry. If you're creating content around cars and you've got an audience, you obviously are valuable to a manufacturer. You're valuable to your audience that, that follow you and all of that stuff. And I think this lockdown has shown that content creation, whether it be about cars whether it be about travel i mean i've even been watching a lot of youtube stuff about golf because i really love golf yeah. and also love cycling i've been watching so much stuff even if it's a year or two old i've been watching a, a hell of a lot of content mm. surrounding this stuff and i appreciate it so much because youtube is a free platform mm. if you are willing to get around the ads unless you go premium mm. um you know even netflix to a certain degree you know it's content creation people are creating things to entertain you i think this lockdown is bringing content creators and people like us to the fore and saying, look, you need these people because in certain situations, yeah. content is really king to entertain people. I very really yeah. much agree with you. And also, Sean, um, before we, I think we can start moving on to our, our, our first topic, you are quite a racing driver, but we're going to get onto that with your little Toyota Supra adventure you had. <laughs> I was following that. I think it was the Neisner at the hill climb road you did, no? Um, I've done hill climb before, but this was the Emerald Speed Fest. Emerald, there, we go, there, we the go, there we go. And you came. You, you what? What you placed? You placed first. In in my class, yeah. yeah. So I didn't come close. To the likes of Rachard Roots, but uh, we were put into different classes. So um, the class that I competed in was uh, basically production car, standard tires, and rear wheel drive. So that's where the Supra sort of slotted in there. Quickly, and, um, be, be, before before you before you let you go further, tell me quickly what other cars were competing in that class. Um, so it was a bit complicated. In in that class, we had a, a Porsche Boxster S. Oh wow! Um, the Alpha Julia Quadrifoglio, hmm. 
Uh, that's a, that was a very fast car to, to go up against. Um, I also had a, a gentleman in a Noble. I don't know if you remember the, yes, the original yes. Nobles. I think it's a M400, the, yes. the twin turbocharged yep. on their engine. Yes, yes, yes. It was one of those. And then I was racing against Tom Thomas Falkner in another Supra. He's also a motoring journalist and racing driver. Um, so we were going at it the weekend. But the impressive thing is that that Supra actually – uh, between Tom and I, our two times were actually quicker than that big AMG GT4 63S. We were quicker than than Natalie Weston in that car up that climb. That goes to show you how quick that Super is. It is just oh, so incredible. impressive. And I think I think also what's down to that car is what something Ernest and I were talking about the other day. It's incredible chassis balance and weight distribution. <laughs> I mean, just aside from the fact that that car has got a torque converter, mm. that thing is about as sharp as you could possibly want your sports car to be. You know, a torque converter yeah. can take a lot of power, but it doesn't have that that snap-on fast, yeah. lightning-fast gear change response that a dual-clutch gearbox does. So apart from the torque converter, that thing, the chassis and the engine, it's just so brilliantly balanced. Mm. I, I, I was so impressed with it. I can't even mm. tell you. We, oh. we did not expect to do as well. What time did you place versus the second and third position? Um, so my teammate, Tom Feltner, before mm. uh, we both did the second last stint of the day, uh, him and I were 0. 0.002 seconds away from each other. So I was faster <laughs> than him by, you could probably, it was probably two centimeters over the finish line. That's, mm -hmm. how, that's how close it would be like like that if you had to overlay the cars. Yeah. That's how close. But um, the two Supras were uh, two and a half seconds quicker than that uh, Alpha up that climb. What? About three seconds quicker than Yeah. <laughs> how? Yeah. Uh, they, Toyota, Toyota South Africa were there. Uh, mm. Their representative was Rian Estes, and who's yes, their product yes, yes. expert. And he he was so impressed with the car as well. I mean, I don't even think they expected the car to be as quick as it was. It was eye opening, and I mean, it was on bone stock, everything, standard tires, normal ninety five octane petrol. They literally that that car that I drove, it was used for filming the Bachelor South Africa. Oh, wow. they were using that for the Bachelor run the skid pan it came from Giratech, was cleaned and delivered to my house to take to Emerald Speed Fair. So it was absolutely bog standard. Yo. I'm blown yeah. away. So and I was I was blown away by the car too. I mean my father was there and he's got a Porsche GT three and mm. I mean he he actually went for a spin with me in the car and he couldn't believe how good that car was too. I mean it's such an underrated product and mm. I see they sell between five and ten a month here, and it's such a shame. Man. It's like okay. the eighty six, okay. except the eighty six had had a few drawbacks. It was legitimately slow in a straight yeah. line, but this car is fast in a straight line. It is uh, a brilliant around corners. It's got great brakes. It's got a strong, robust drivetrain, and I think it looks awesome. It, mm. And it's called a Supra. It's got a Supra badge yeah. on the back. It's just it boggles my mind that they're not yeah. selling more of it. I I, I think. Um I think, you know, the hardcore super person, I, I can't say I'm one. Um, I've been, how do I say, I've, I've, I haven't been like, like super didn't come to South Africa. The, the, the mock, two, mock, is the mock three or mock four, mock three super. So like, it's hard to say, oh, I'm the biggest super fan, but I've never driven one. So I don't really know what it's like. So I don't think super has such a, 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 a how do I say, an appeal to me. However, with Supra having the BMW driveline, like, it affected a lot of fanboys, I think. But it didn't affect people like me going into the car going, oh, okay, so it's a BMW. I, I, 
I, I didn't think it spoiled the car. Do you know what I mean? Whereas with those hardcore Supra people who I don't think has ever driven a Mark 3 Supra, um, bleating on social media about how bad the car is when in fact, I mean, I had the car in Kilani, um, I raced the car there, um, I did, um, by us, we have Franz Schuch Pass and a couple of the roads, I'm obviously far from a racing driver. Um, I love the car and, and Ernest and I argued about this a lot, but I'm a bit more of a maniac, so M2 competition appealed to me more at the time, and I think still does now. Um... I do agree with you, I, I, but but I will be honest with you. Um, people like TJ Hunt and, and Adam LZ, he's kind of starting to put that car on the map a little bit better, I think, and giving it a bit more representation. Yeah. So, look, fr- from my perspective, w- when, when people say to me that the new Supra is not a new Supra, you know, having a BMW drivetrain in the car makes that a much better car than... The previous Supra, and I know there'll be a lot of Supra fans out there of the previous generation that are probably going to hate on me in your comment section. <laughs> but the previous Supra was not a very good car mm. before it, it had a phenomenal engine. Two JZ GTE mm. could take what eight hundred horsepower yeah. stock standard with E mods, and that was really what it was all about. This the straight line performance. With an enormous, you have to have an enormous turbocharger with all this lag. Mm. Um, wasn't a very good car, not a great chassis. I remember when I was growing up, my uncle uh, was the manager of a used car dealership, and we used to get some pretty cool cars coming into uh, my grandparents' house on the weekend. And my father actually took me for a drive in a Toyota Supra, uh, the previous generation. You know, the Brian O'Connor yes, generation yes, 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 with yes, the two J. Yes, yes, yes. He took me for a. Yep. A stock standard uh, 2JZN was still a manual car that was brought in. This was years ago. I must have been about, I don't know, 12, 13 years old. And my father had an E36 M3 at the time, and he was so underwhelmed by that Supra Mm. that he said, you know, he would take his M3 every time over Mm. that car. It's only when you really start modifying the car that it becomes the legend that we know as the Supra, you know, the 2JZ. 2,000 horsepower things on YouTube, you know? Mm. But yeah, the no. Supra, as it is now, oh, is standard. It's, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. And and that's, you know, when I did a video on that car, I, I don't think I've ever got so much bad um, press, like, in my inbox because of it. People were, and, 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 yeah, people were quite mean. And when I go into their profile to check how old they were, they were, like, 15, 16, 17. Yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I was like, right, I'm not going to get involved now. At least I know I'm speaking to an audience that actually gets this car. Um, there were a few things about that car that um, that, 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 that stuck with me. And we, we have touched on it already. It's definitely a chassis. And just the way just the way its momentum changes mid-corner to exiting a corner. It's just so beautifully balanced, my God. Do you know what the thing is with that, that Supra is? When I compare that to like a BMW M2 competition, the M2 has got that dual clutch gearbox and the the torque spike of the S55 engine is quite hectic. So it breaks traction very quickly. You come halfway through a corner, you put your foot flat, the thing just like sort of snaps on you. And that's really fun. Yeah. But it's not the most effective way of going around the corner. Whereas you get into... The Supra, it's got that new B58 motor from BMW. It's Mm. silky smooth. The torque delivery is a lot better, more progressive. Mm. And that torque converter gearbox spreads out the gear so nicely that you've got a car that you can actually attack corners with in confidence. I mean, if you want to be a hooligan, the M2 is better. But if you want a a car that's going to set a better lap time and be a more, you know, effective driving tool, I think the Supra is going to be quicker. It just feels like that to me. Uh Sean, uh, I think let's move this conversation on quickly to uh, uh, racing driving. What got you? What what got you to the point where you are now that gives you the confidence you have um, around the racetrack? Because personally, when I go around a racetrack, I don't know where to brake, and people's probably gonna laugh at me now. But I don't know where to brake. Like I, I was, you were with me, I think, on the Jaguar, on the Jaguar. Um, we went around the track. Yes, that ex- yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes, yes. 
from experience. Yeah, the instructor's hands went onto the dashboard at one point. That's when I knew I fucked up. <laughs> Uh, that's when you need a camera in the car, but yeah. you can see the guy. Like, oh. <laughs> yeah, we were sideways in one corner, and he wasn't very impressed because I had to compensate now for coming in too hot. Look at him. Look, look. From my perspective, I'm not like I'm not by any stretch of the imagination a, a pucker racing driver. You know, I don't race every weekend or anything. I oh, just. You know, when I was when I was growing up, my father was very into karting, and he used to uh, race every week and take me with him. Um, and then on the weekends, he would take me to like a rental car place, and he would put me on his lap when I was really little and drive with me around. Um, and when I got sort of old enough, I would say twelve or thirteen, I always found myself loving going to do social go karting. My my dad didn't really have enough cash to put me through two-stroke karting because it was exorbitantly expensive to to race two-stroke karts and then you know when i got my first car and when i got my first motorbikes i had the the freedom to just you know ride and drive like a hooligan if i you know was in the right space like a racetrack like swipe corpse in my father's old mini cooper s or if i went on to a motocross track with a motocross bike or a track day at kalami on my my super bike when i was a bit older and i just sort of taught myself you know how to uh you know control things i mean i fell off my motorbike so many times yeah. um i put my my father's mini cooper s through a wall <laughs> when i was uh, 17 years old um so i think very early on in my sort of driving career i learned you know, to be, if I'm going to push the car to first of all, be cautious, maybe take a lap or two to get used to things. And then, I don't know, it's almost like, you know, once you do it enough, it becomes quite a natural thing. You kind of know where to brake, especially if you know the, the racetrack, like a SWAT Corps or a Kyle Army. I know if I'm doing 230, for example, going into the first corner at Kyle Army, I know that I need to brake just after the 100 meter mark if I'm in a performance car and it'll give me plenty of time to, to slow down in one of these modern cars. It's just mm. one of those things I think with practice you get yeah. more and more clients to, to when you need to brake. And I mean, when you like when I did that, that Polo Cup uh, event at Desi Raceway and the one at Kyle Army, they blocked out the, the speedometer so you can't see what yeah. the car is doing in terms of revs you can't see the speed um, so you're just do, doing that based on feel yeah. so I think the more you practice the the easier it becomes really it's it's yeah. not a, a case of you know just being born with the ability you have yeah. to practice 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 and and then you get better at it yeah no I, I, I've I'll, you know we I've gotten such intense cars here on Liberable over the last few um few months i mean from m5 competition to m2 to super to rs4 i think my biggest um like fear um on the channel is the how fast these modern cars are getting they they you know you, you like lighting reflexes aren't even quick enough anymore for m5 competition because if someone runs out into the road or Flip if a car jumps a robot and I mean if you hold your foot down, I put my foot flat in the M5 comp from 80 kilometers per hour. I held it flat for like seven seconds. I can't say what speed I was doing. Just seven seconds is a stupid number. So yeah, yeah, I I I, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, let me get you on to some uh, uh, a more uh, a more uh, curious yeah. question. What um. Yes. What was your least favorite vehicle of 2019 through to 2020 that you've driven? Uh, obviously, this is in terms of test cars. Yeah. Um, look, I've, I've, I've got a, a pretty solid go-to car in terms of things that I hate, and that's the Renault Quid AMT. <laughs> the Renault's budget car, but with the automated manual yeah. gearbox. So for... People uh, watching or listening, the SMG gearbox from BMW, the SMG1, yeah. feels like a fuel clutch gearbox compared to the AMT in a Reynolds Quit. That's how slow this thing is. <laughs> and you put that gearbox in combination with a one-liter three-cylinder engine up here at altitude in Gauteng, where I stay, 
um, 18 percent power loss mm. approximately the car is just dead yeah. and in addition to that the first uh, generation quid not the the current uh, model that we have mm. the first ones that came to south africa were very unstable at anything yeah. over i'd say 100 kilometers an hour and they didn't instill any driver confidence whatsoever so mm. you know that is always and potentially will always be the worst test car i've had at wow. this point in my life <laughs> wow wow that's really interesting i think um one of my biggest surprises i think has to be or not surprise but surprising bad car um has to be the honda <laughs> civic i'm shocked at what honda's yeah. putting out honda I've, I've written about it i actually wrote an article a couple of weeks ago about how Honda has slipped. You know, my first car was uh, a Honda Ballard, mm. an 1800. So it had that, uh, I think it's a B18, mm. non VTEC. Mm. But that car was phenomenal. I used to have guys with VTECs coming and asking if they could buy my gearbox <laughs> from me because apparently they from gearboxes. Mm. They wanted to give me their VTEC gearboxes. And I loved my Honda so much and it was so well built. My old Bellotte is still going over 400,000 Ks on the clock. Some old lady in my area bought it from uh, from me a few years ago and it's still going over 400,000 Ks. Yeah. And you know, when I hop into a, a modern Honda, apart from the, the Civic Type R and maybe the, the CRV, mm. I feel like they've just lost the plot. Like they just don't have that appeal that they used to have yeah. and they're expensive, like that's super that's expensive. You know, I, I, it, it, it was a rude awakening when I had, I remember my fleet manager sent me the, the new CRV with with like zero kilometers on the clock. There's probably only 25 kilometers on the clock. And it was the 1.8 liter, was it the naturally aspirated with the CVT gearbox? Oh my <laughs> Lord, sure. I, 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 I didn't put the video out because you could see in the video I, I was fishing and I, I don't like I don't know what to say. I mean, from interior yeah. to to seats to 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 the quality of the ride is just completely off the mark. So who's gonna buy that over, let's say, a Tiguan? Exactly. I mean, a Tiguan makes that car look a generation old already. Yeah. It's just better in in every single way. Yeah. So you know, Honda, especially. You know, from a newspaper background and a, a dealership uh, background, I've had them pull advertising with the publication I work for, for the things I've said about Honda before. Mm. And, you know, you know, it's, it's my duty to say things like that in the press. If I don't think that the product is up to standard, I'm yeah. going to say it. And yeah. I will always be a fan. I mean, if I could afford it, I would have the new Civic Type R in my garage because that's my favorite hot hatch. Mm. And, you know... The Reynold people who think I'm obsessed with Reynold, the only reason I have my McGann is because it's an affordable way for me to have fun on the track. If wow. I had the money and I wanted a front-wheel drive car, I would get the new tire part because that is the best performance front-wheel drive hatchback yeah. to drive. I don't disagree with you. I disagree. I've so, actually driven the, the Civic Type R recently and it, it is a shocking amount of traction through the front wheels and, I mean, the chassis as well. However... I can't get over um, the look of that car. And I won't be able to wake up every morning and walk into my driveway and see it standing there. You know what it looks like? It looks like someone put a magnet in the middle of the car and then crashed it into auto style showroom <laughs> and all the parts are just yeah. sort of congregated. On. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a really, I've got red seats. I mean, you know, if I think about, you know, cars, I always think, would my girlfriend approve, you know? Mm. Like when she gets into certain cars, she's like, oh, what is this? Oh, what is that? Mm. I don't think if she hopped into a, a car with all the wings and fins with red seats, I don't know if she would approve so much, yeah. you know, of, of yeah. the car. Yeah. So I always think of it from yeah. that perspective. And that's why they sell GTIs in droves yeah. because it's just a good all-round car. It Maybe looks good, soul. isn't over the top, and it goes nicely. I'm, you know? I'm, I'm actually in the opposite boat as you. I would take the McGann 280 RS any day over the Civic Type R. I fucking love that car. It is, it is, it is pretty good. But I think you won't press by the trophy. I mean, the trophy is it's here. They're just waiting to launch it until after lockdown. I think you'll love that car even more because I'm pretty sure this is what Renault tend to do with their hot hatchbacks. They launch one that's that's pretty good. 
Mm. And then the one that comes after it, the facelift, has addressed all the issues with the car. Mm. So this trophy is probably going to be the car that the 280 should have been mm. from the get-go. So it's now yeah. going to 300, so it'll have like 224 kilowatts versus 206 or 204. Yeah. I can't remember the exact output. Mm. It'll have a proper uh, LSD with the, the EDC gearbox instead of just the, the open differential. Um and I think that it's going to sort out all of the, the issues that we had with both Cup and Lux in the current Megane. Mm. But I still, I still dig the new Megane. Dude, I, I, think it's a good... I threw fuel in a 280 RS and um, it was at the garage parking and my brother was sitting in the car. He drove back home from where we were. And I stood in front of that car and my eyes turned red. So emotionally beautiful is that car. Fuck. Must be the best looking hot tap stage. It just looks like nothing else. <laughs> it's a, it's a very few cars. Like, you know, when you get a Golf GTI, you think to yourself, ah, I could put a set of OZs on it and maybe drop it a bit lower, you know, and make it look a bit more, you know, I don't know, give you a little bit more street cred or whatever. But that 280, just out of the box, I wouldn't do anything to it. It just looks that good from the... From the Yo, 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 dude, I, 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 I'm so obsessed currently with what Renault is, um, is doing and, and this moves me swiftly on to, to what's powering the, the 280, which is a Nissan engine and on the topic of Nissan, oh my Lord, what has happened to this company? <laughs> they just have old products, like they, they just really need to bring new cars, I mean, uh, the X-Trail is ancient, the Qashqai is ancient, the NP200 is ancient, and it's based on that Dacia platform, which was, you know, the old Sandero and yeah. the Logan and all that stuff. Um, the, the GTR is, is ancient now, it needs to be replaced, the 370Z is ancient, the Duke is now gone. Uh, I've got a feeling we're going to see some new cars from, from Renault, uh, I mean from Nissan, and if they're anything like that micro that's that came out last year or the year before that they, they should be a lot more up to date in terms of you know offering a competitor in the segment yeah but at this stage yes, there's just nothing exciting mm. happening with nissan and I'm, just no. you know for me what was the was a was a rude awakening in the nissan micro although it, it had a really good three-cylinder engine it had a really good manual transmission I opened the back doors and I'm like, holy crap, there's no speakers in the back doors. It was missing, like for its price and in its segment it was competing. I'm like, Mazda 2 is apocalyptically better than than um, than Micra. Then there's, I think, the the small little Volkswagen Polo. The Polo. There's the uh, Ford Fiesta. That segment and there's the Clio, which, you know, the... Micro shares a platform with, you know, mm. and you know, if you look at the new Clio, I mean, that thing is going to be super impressive. If you go check out the new interior online, new exterior, it's got a new engine in it. Um, we might see that that thirteen hundred engine from the Mercedes A class because mm. that was developed in conjunction with Renault and Mercedes. So we may see see that in the in the Clio at some point, or we get that new one liter turbo from the Micro. Um, yeah, that that micro is is competitive with some of the some of the cars in the segment now. But I think when the new ones come out, then it's going to be behind again. Yeah. Which, yeah, like Nissan can't catch up. They can't. They can't. And I mean, a company that, that when Carlos Ghosn was um, CEO, he he managed to build a GTR which was at the forefront of technology. It it took the Europeans barely, I think, barely two years. For them to outperform GTR by almost a second or two on the Nurburgring. Yeah, well, that's the thing is that that GTR was an incredible project. You know, with that that special factory and the hand built mm. engines, and the fact that this was a very affordable supercar um, at the time. But you know, the Europeans, obviously, as you say, they caught wind of it, and the product that has come out in the new turbocharged era from Europe. I mean, if you look at what Porsche are doing, if you look at what Ferrari are doing, uh, you look at what McLaren are doing, uh, those cars are now ridiculous. I mean, 
there's cars that you can go buy in South Africa with just your average license and it will do a 10 second quarter mile. Mm. And if you, if you chat to, you know, people who've been drag racing for, for decades, um, particularly I used to have a Subaru. If you had a Subaru that ran in the tens in South Africa, you were worshipped within yeah. the Subaru community because that is so incredibly fast. Now you can go buy a Porsche Turbo S, put in our substandard 95 octane petrol and run a 10.8 second quarter mile, and you can do that 50 times in a row yeah. and the car will be fine. Yeah. The GTR was impressive in 2008. Now the GTR is just sort of mediocre, if not substandard compared mm. to what's out now. And it's gotten really expensive. Mm -hmm. So we need to do something. There needs to be like a hybrid supercar from them. They from definitely does. To, to sort of they definitely does. But I don't think Nissan has the budget. Honestly, they, they, they're falling, they're sinking faster than the, than the Titanic at the moment. Yeah, that's sad. And you know that they make really good, reliable products, Nissan. And I think that you've seen Toyota, who've also got that same reputation you know, for producing, if you know, somewhat bland, but very reliable cars. Mm -hmm. But now Toyota have woken up to the fact that, you know, you can't just produce Corollas, Camrys, a couple of Yaris models and the Hilux and be successful going forward. Mm -hmm. You have to diversify and make interesting looking cars. Like if you look at CHR, if you take Supra and their entire GR and GRMN programs, you can see that Toyota have taken this idea which Nissan have had with the GTR and sort of expanded to create exciting cars that are attainable. Because think about Nissan in South Africa, we used to have that Sabre 200 yeah. STI with the VVL and I mean, those things are legendary cars in South Africa, but what do you buy from Nissan in South Africa now that's affordable, that the average guy like Gurney can buy and go and, you know, do drag racing at events or track days or whatever, there is nothing. Yeah. Because we yeah. can't afford a GTR. They're yeah. attainable performance car, you know? Um, before They're we exciting move, car. Yeah, no, before we move swiftly on to Porsche, um, about that Toyota you're talking about now, I had um, the Toyota Quest just before lockdown. What a good car! Yeah. No, they, they're really good at that. Toyota and sedans, I mean, that's their bread and butter, man. Yeah, they're really yeah. good at that. Yeah. Sean, all built in South Africa. Yeah. Sean, you had an experience which I'm so jealous over. Guys, Sean got to drive um, the Porsche GT3. Tell me, talk to me, what was it like? So uh, you might hate me a bit more. I had I got to drive two GT3s on two different occasions. So the first one was um, the 992.2, the standard GT3, but with a six-speed manual gearbox. Ooh. And then after that, I got to drive the car that I'm sure South Africa's Instagram has seen a million times. Mm. That's called the Lizard. Yes, yes. That's the 992.2 GT3 RS mm. with the YSAC pack. So, you know, that... When any when anyone asks me what the best car I've ever driven is, it's not an Aventador, it's not a 488, it's not the Huracan, mm. it's it's none of the the usual suspects. It's a it's a GT3 or a GT3 RS, and it's just down to the fact that that if you're a keen driver, that is the best car on the planet, genuinely mm. for for the money. I mean, I know. The GT3 RS we drove was uh, 5 million Rand with options, mm -hmm. but I don't think you have to go that crazy. You could spend maybe 2 million, 2.5 million bucks on a used GT3 and you legitimately have the best, you know, supercar that you can use on a daily basis on the planet. It's just mm -hmm. so phenomenal. The engine, the gearbox, Ooh. everything is just great. I mean, 9,000 RPM. Four liter flat yeah. six with that induction sound in the cabin, dude. I my my YouTube uh, library history is full of GT3 exhausts and, and and POV videos. I can't get enough of that car. My God. So I I can't. It's something that I wish I could I could I wish I could impart the feeling that the car gives you when you drive it because. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people talk about how a car feels when they drive it or whatever, but the GT3, especially that RS, is the only car that I've really had a physical sensation remain in my body 
you know, for hours after driving it. Mm. And because it revs to 9,000 RPM, it's got a, a proper roll cage in it. The, the model that we tested had a roll cage, so it's dinging and, and rattling and mm. stuff the entire time. Um, my hands were actually sort of vibrating and the, the sound of the motor was sort of ringing in my ears when wow. I went to bed that night, when I went to sleep. That's the first car that's ever done that to me. And um, uh, I first time I put that car into launch control was at a, a traffic light in Cape Town. And my driving partner was from Top Gear, South Africa. Um, after I launched that car, we were just quiet in the car. I, I changed from first to second. Uh, and then I just tapped off in second because I had already had enough. The the sound that that car makes when you're inside and you activate launch control and you actually let go and let it rev out to 9,000. I just, I wish I could give everybody that experience yeah. just once so they could use. It's not about the, the G-forces. It's about the sound and the vibrations and the way that the car, you know, sort of slips uh, to get traction. It's mm. unbelievable. And then mm. you get to the handling and the balance and all of the, the the gear shifts and just the way everything feels. It's just, that's almost perfect in yeah. you know, the way that that car is. You know, I, I, I'm just, just talking about the sitting shivers down my spine. I'm just, I'm such a Porsche fuck. I, I think we all need to be more wealthy in this country. <laughs> I, I just wish that everybody could have one mm. for a day just mm. to experience it and they, then they could see what it's all about. and. You know, when I, I speak to a lot of people, they when they speak about their dream cars, it'll be like a McLaren or a Lamborghini. Um, but, you know, for me, it would always be that, that particular Porsche um, with a naturally aspirated engine and the PDK gearbox. The manual was really great, but that PDK gearbox, for someone who liked going around the track, I mean the purists will hate the fact that the manual gearbox is dying, but if you're going for lap times and you want to have a good time around the track, that PDK can change gears way faster than anyone. So from a lap time perspective, that's the thing to go for. But if mm. you want a visceral driving experience where you're in control, you can order a, a normal GT3 with a manual mm. gearbox. Mm. And that's also a great car to drive, you know? And wow. yeah, I think Porsche is just great. I very much agree with you. I, I think um, one of the cars that stuck with me, obviously I've never driven a Porsche, which I'm planning to do soon after this lockdown ends. Um, a car that I, I went in going, ah man, this can't be that impressive. I, I've, I've seen this car uh, over again in Cape Town all the time in Constantia. Um, was the SVR um, F-Type that you and I drove at, um, at Kailami. It's a car that... Yes. It literally made me emotional driving it. It had such old school. I can't say it. I don't it's know like what the muscle car. Yeah, it's got that that same. It's like you don't really care. It is very fast. Like mm. don't don't get me wrong, but it's not all about that. It's mm. about the sound and just it, it's almost like a it's almost like a car carved out of iron and I don't know. It's like the <laughs> ultimate man. Four wheel drive coupe. It's, I don't know. It just gave me this like really manly feeling yeah, to drive it around. Yeah. You know, everyone thinks, oh, this guy must be a bit of a doist, you know, because he's driving around in this loud Jaguar, but you don't really care because mm. it's it's so cool. My God. You know, that's one of the loudest exhaust systems I've ever heard in the production car. I don't know how that's even legal. It's unbelievable. It's almost louder than my Reynolds. And I mean, that that's saying something because I don't have any exhaust boxes in my car. So but for that Jag to be closer. Have you heard in, in Australia they recalled that car because it was too loud? I, I can totally understand that because if you drive past uh, like a Jaguar Land Rover experience in Lone Hill, like when I was on my way there and I was driving up past Kalami, I could hear that car with my windows down in traffic. I could hear them you know, driving those yeah. SVRs up and down yeah. that experience from, you know, a kilometer away in traffic in my car with the windows closed. Yeah. So that's loud for a production car. Yeah. I mean, imagine straight popping that. Oh, no. Be, it would be, you'd be deaf. But you know what? <laughs> now, I really do love the way Jaguar is, is placing themselves as a company. It's like, it's like there's a 10 year old at the helm of Jaguar and putting out all these cars with titanium exhaust tubs and stupidly big dust in front and 
silly colors. I love the brand. Love them. And I'm like, like I had that F. I think it's F Pace SVR. Yeah. Recently, and you get in, and it's got these beautiful carpets. It's like the nicest carpets. You put that carpet in your lounge. <laughs> All the carpets in the car are nice enough to go in your lounge. The seats are like an old cigar smoking chair, <laughs> and in and then it's got this old supercharged V8, old school sound to it. It's not the fastest gear change, but it's like such a gangster. Yeah, car. like I know people say that you know Ray Donovan suits a Mercedes CLS. I think he would look way more badass in like an F Pace SVR. A black one. Go and do his- a blacked out yeah. FPS SVR. That's so gangster. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Sean. Sean, thank you so much for joining me here on Liberable today. I really um, appreciate it. And this has been a really interesting and eye-opening conversation to certain topics. Um, guys, I will leave all Sean's uh, publications, his social media, all in the description box below. You guys can go and have a look at what he is doing. And when he is in Cape Town, I will try and do a collaboration video with him. Obviously, now with... Uh, Corona, I don't think um, we're going to see... Uh, say again? You need to drive my car. Yeah. You need to drive my car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what power is your Renault making now? Uh, it makes... It's not a lot. It's two, 237 mm. wheel kilowatts and 480 yeah. newton meters, but it's more about the chassis. So mm. it's got a whole bunch of you know coilovers and bigger brakes and... Uh, strut braces and a roll cage and all that stuff so it's all about the handling that car so mm. it's it's like my budget take on a club sport s you so are. i'd really like for you to explain. yeah definitely <laughs> definitely definitely anyway sean thank you so much for joining me here today i really appreciate it have a good um, day further and try and uh, keep safe from this corona thing i think that's what we all need to do no? thanks man Dude. pleasure bye bye sean yeah. Bye. Bye. Okay, guys, thank you so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it. Sean is such a cool guy and he underplayed himself with with him talking about him as a racing driver. Trust me, this guy is like next level when it comes to taking a car around the track. But guys, thank you so much for watching this video. Be free, be you. Liberable. Ow.